Good morning. Pleased to see each and every one of you. If you're visiting with us, we are glad you're here. You are honored guest amongst the Lord's people. We thank you for seeking out the Lord in His way this morning. Uh, we'd like to get to know you, like to get, like to get to help you, so please stay after services so we can get to know you a little bit. According to a recent website I looked at, there are, in Tucson alone, 20 separate denominations, listed at least, in Tucson. Among those 20 separate denominations, there is 225 separate congregations. Now, the problem with that statistic is it was, it's a self-reporting website, so only the groups that actually volunteered their information for Tucson. Now, you think about that for a moment. That's just what's been volunteered. And there's probably, we could probably multiply that number by at least two, if not four times. In fact, thinking, excuse me here, thinking ahead just a moment, that's just what's reported. So we can maybe say 40, maybe 450 separate congregations. And this is compared to what we see is, glo uh, not globally, nationally, there's some 200 separate distinct denominations. Now there's a problem with these, these numbers. Uh, denominationalism is collapsing right now. People are, are tired of the religious division. There is something that's been rise of what's called micro-denominations of groups within groups that actually don't follow the main group's teaching, but they still call themselves after that group. Most of your community churches fall underneath that kind of category. Uh, they'll, they'll call themselves a some, certain name, and then in a, in a fine print on their website, they'll say a member of the Southern Baptist Convention or something. Um, or you get individuals that go out on their own and they're a denomination of one. So these numbers are kind of just a rule of thumb. I spent probably longer than I should have researching trying to come up with an exact number. It's very hard. Uh, some, some individuals were claiming that there's some 45,000 separate churches globally. That number seems too low to me. But before we go on and really introduce to Ms. Warren's topic, what do we mean by denominations? Because some may be saying, well, what's the big deal about all these different denominations? If I were to pull out my wallet, well, if I were to carry cash, um, I would have notes of various denominations. That is, they denote something. A 1 and a 5, a 10 and a 20, and maybe a Benjamin Franklin at 100. Uh, but another definition that you would find is, it's, uh, according to one source, is a group, a, a group or branch of any religion. Now the funny thing is, if you do the word study, to denominate something, where it comes from in the Latin, is to distinguish it in name from something else. Two things of a different denomination cannot, by their very nature, be the same thing. So that second definition, a group or branch of any religion, that can't be true because they're different in nature. There is a reason why the Baptist church does not assemble with the Methodist church. They differ from one another. And just by these statistics of looking at, just let's just go back to Tucson, looking at what Tucson is, of one trying to be an honest follower of God may look at all that and say, well, how am I supposed to choose? Or Christianity is helplessly divided. That's not a wrong conclusion when you use that word Christianity in the most broadest sense. And some may be asking, can I just be a Christian without having to be a member of any denominational body? And the great answer to that is, I'm going to give away the whole lesson, is yes. You can be just a Christian without being a member of any denominational body. And this morning I'm going to submit to you that actually denominationalism is not what the Lord intended. It goes contrary to what the Lord commands. And so this morning we want to start looking at that. First, the point we want to look at is the fact that there were no denominations in the first century. Turn with me to Ephesians, the fourth chapter. Looking here at Ephesians chapter 4, I think this is a section that many of us may know pretty well. Um, looking at verses 4 through 6. Now, the big theme of the book of Ephesians, coincidentally enough... It's about the church. 
It's the one letter we have in the, one of the few letters we have in the New Testament that doesn't address any one wrong, false doctrine, but it's an encouraging letter to remind Christians about the things they ought to be doing and how the church is supposed to function amongst believers. And we get here in this section of Christian unity, which is written again to Christians. He says here in verse 4, There is one body and one spirit, just as you were called in one hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of, of all who is over all and through all and in all. That one body there is, refers to the body of Christians, the group of Christians. And so the Bible, and this is not the only verse we're going to look at this morning, but I think it's a very powerful one, puts forth the idea and the, and the platform, if you will, that there is only one body of believers, and not, it is a unified body, it is not a divided body. In fact, this is underscored when you look at verse 6 again, because the unity that Christians are supposed to have amongst the body of believers is likened to the unity that God has of himself. There is one God and Father, who is over all and through all and in all. We might ask, well, is God divided? Does God fight amongst himself? Does God pre present a divided front? And the answer to all those questions would be no. Now, don't take just my word for it. Even individuals in denominations concede this point, that in the first century there were no denominations. An individual by the name of Edward T. Hiscox, who wrote the Standard Manual for Baptist Churches, had this to say in regards to church membership. He said, it is most likely that in the apostolic age, when there was but one Lord, one faith, and one baptism, and no differing denominations existed, the baptism of a convert by the very act constituted him as a member of the church. Now it is different. Under, uh, underline in your mind that point. No differing denominations existed. And what gets me is that last line, now it is different. If the man was still alive today, I would ask him some very simple questions. Well, one, why is it different? What has changed from the first century to today when it comes to God? There is it is still the same, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one body, one God and Father who is over all and in all and through all. So what changed? Because if we still believe that the Bible is the power to save man, and it is still the unchanged word of God, what happened? And I think the answer we're going to see is that, well, mankind happened. That's, that's what happened. But going on, not only in Ephesians, but let's look at the book of Acts for a moment. The book of Acts records the first some 30 years of church history. And looking here in the second chapter, starting in verse 41. On the day of Pentecost, when the church came into existence, the gospel in its completed form was preached for the first time. The death, burial, and resurrection. Christ had ascended on high and give, given the church, the, given the apostles their marching orders. And so that gospel is preached. Peter is preaching. In fact, it's not on the screen, but look in verse 21. He gets done quoting from Joel. And he says in verse 21, quoting from Joel, he says, It shall be that everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. He spends the rest of the sermon identifying who that Lord is, that you should call upon him and be saved. And looking in verse, uh, actually, let's back up to verse 36. I want to get the full thrust of Peter's argument here. After he has identified Christ as that Lord on whom we should call, he said, therefore... Let all the house of Israel know for certain that God has made them both Lord and Christ, this Jesus whom you crucified. Now when they heard this, they were pierced to the heart and said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, Brethren, what shall we do? Peter said to them, Repent, and each one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. And he kept on preaching them in those, ne in those next two verses. You look at verse 41, it says, So then... Those who had received his word were baptized, and on that day were added about 3,000 souls. They were continually devoting themselves to the apostles' teaching, and to fellowship, and to breaking of bread, and to prayer. And you jump down to verse 46 to 47. Talking about day by day, continuing with one mind in the temple, and the breaking of bread from house to house, they were taking their meals together with gladness and sincerity of heart, praising God and having favor with all the people. 
And the Lord was adding to their number day by day those who were being saved. Now if you have the New King James or King James and say the Lord was adding to the church in verse 47. The church comes from the word ecclesia, which means it's used in reference to an assembly of people who have come together for a purpose. So their number, or the church, means the same thing in your translations. But a point I, I hope that we've all seen here in this is when they heard the gospel, and they obeyed the gospel, and they were united with Christ in baptism, and they were raised to walk a new life, as Paul tells us in Romans 6, they became just disciples, Christians. Not Baptists, not Methodists, not Catholics, not any form of Protestant. They became Christians. That, that was all that was needed in the first century. That was sufficient enough for them. In fact, you look in Acts chapter 11 and verse 26. This is some time later, after Gentiles have been added or non-Jewish people had been accepted into the church. They had always been accepted, but thanks to sometimes man's prejudice, they weren't preaching to them. Now they were. You look here in the 26th verse. After uh, Saul, who was known as Paul, uh, it says here in verse 26, And when he had found him, he brought him to Antioch. And for an entire year they met with the church and taught considerable numbers. And the disciples were first called Christians in Antioch. Again, not to beat a dead horse. They weren't called Baptists or Lutherans or Methodists. They were called Christians and Christians only. Nothing more, nothing less. So if this point is seen here, that there were no denominations in the first century, we're left asking the question, well, what happened? And that's a very important question. Gradually, mankind started adding to God's pattern, or taking away from God's pattern. And this is mankind's history. Mankind tends to change God's plan. I, I think of, for example, in... Uh, 1 Samuel chapter 15, when it came to Saul, Saul knew he wasn't a, a priest, a, a tribe of Levi. He had no right offering sacrifices. So he offers the sacrifice. Excuse me, that's earlier in 1 Samuel, but in 1 Samuel chapter 15, God gave him explicit instructions what he was to do. He was to go destroy the Amalekites and not take a single thing, destroy them utterly. And Saul thought, well, I'll take some. Earlier in the book of Samuel, this is one of my favorites, because if, it was, if the Bible was narrated like a sitcom, Saul gets done and says, you know, I have a good idea. I'm going to make a monument to myself, even go, though God told me not to. That's when the narrator would pause the scene and say, it would not be a good idea. Mankind has a habit of adding to God's plan. In fact, in Proverbs, this holds true. In the Proverbs, the 14th chapter in verse 12, the wisdom writer writes, There is a way which seems right to a man, but its end is the way of death. Not necessarily physical death, although that can happen. But we've seen, or we're seeing that right now in the world, what happens when everybody just falls and goes about their own way. All you have to do is turn to just about any page in the Old Testament to see what happens when the children of Israel did God's mission their way. It resulted in destruction and, and hardship and immorality and destruction of homes, and the list goes on and on and on. In fact, I, I want to look at one case in particular in 1 Kings chapter 5. I think this is a good example for many of us today, and it's applicable today. In 1 Kings, the fifth chapter, looking at the first 14 verses, we're going to read about a man by the name of Naaman, who had a horrible, horrible skin condition known as leprosy. Now, we don't have to deal with leprosy much anymore in, this, in, our, in, our, in the developed world because of indoor plumbing and hygiene and, and so forth. But this disease still ravages many parts of the world, and it's a horrible disease where you get these nasty, awful sores, and they don't heal up, and your skin basically starts rotting off the bone. It's, it's a disgusting, horrible, awful, afflicting disease. And this king has it. Oh, one thing I forgot to add about leprosy, it's highly contagious. That's why in the Old Testament, the people, if anyone was suspected of having leprosy, they were removed from the camp during a quarantine period to make sure they didn't have it. 
And if you had it, you were expelled from the camp for the sake of the rest of the people so that disease would not spread. But you look here in 1 Kings chapter 5, verses 1 through 14. Excuse me. I believe this should be 2 Kings. Yes, 2 Kings. Ignore the typo on the screen. His name is not Solomon, and Solomon is not Naaman. But looking here in verse 1, it says, Now Naaman, captain of the army of the king of Aram, was a great man with his master, and highly respected because by, by him, the, excuse me, highly respected because by him the Lord had given victory to Aram. The man was also a valiant warrior, but he was a leper. Now the Arameans had gone out in the band and taken captive a little girl from the land of Israel, and she weighed on Naaman's wife. She said to her mistress, I wish that my master were with the prophet who is in Samaria. Then he could cure him of his leprosy. Naaman went in and told his master, uh, saying, Thus and thus spoke the girl who is from the land of Israel. Then the king of Aram said, Go now, and I will send, uh, send a letter to the king of Israel. He departed and took with him ten talents of silver and six thousand shekels of gold and ten changes of clothes. He brought the letter to the king of Israel, saying, And now, as this letter comes to you, behold, I have sent Naaman my servant to you, that you may cure him of his leprosy. When the king of Israel read the letter, he tore his clothes and said, Am I God to kill and to make alive that this man is, is sending word to me to cure this man of leprosy? But consider now and see he is seeking a quarrel against me. It happened when Elisha, the man of God, heard that the king of Israel had torn his clothes. He sent word to the king, saying, Why have you torn your clothes? Now let him come to me, and he shall know that the, there is a prophet in Israel. So Naaman came with his horses and his chariots and stood at the doorway at the house of Elisha. Elisha sent a messenger to him, saying, Go and wash in the Jordan seven times, and your flesh will be restored to you, and you will be clean. But Naaman was furious and went away, saying, Behold, I thought he would surely come out to me and stand and call on the name of the Lord God, his God, and wave his hand over the place and cure, me, cure the leper. Are not Abinai and Paphar, the, the rivers of Damascus, better than all the waters of Israel? Could I not wash in them and be clean? So he turned and went away in rage. Then his servants came near and spoke to him and said, My father had the, pro excuse me, the, my father had the prophet told you to do something great, uh, some great thing, would you not have done it? How much more then when he says to you, wash and be clean? So he went down and dipped himself seven times in the Jordan, according to the word of the man of God, and his flesh was restored like the flesh of a little child, and he was clean. This whole account shows the attitude when it comes to obeying and following God's word. This man had a horrible disease. And he knew of the source. His, servant, his wife's servant told him of the source where he could go to be clean. So he goes to the source, and because he, was not, he didn't get what he expected, this giant fanfare and, and him to be cleaned by God on his terms, he basically throws a temper tantrum. Goes away in a huff. And it's a servant says, if they had told you to do some great thing, would you not have done it? Why are you refusing to do this simple thing? And you think about when it comes to just following the simple pattern of the New Testament. So many individuals want to add and make Christianity more complicated than it needs to. It's simple for a reason. It's simple to, for our benefit that we we wouldn't mess it up, even though oftentimes we still do. God has gone out of his way to make it as easy to follow as possible. And oftentimes, what happens is mankind gets away and has a better idea, they think. Take about becoming a Christian. It's as simple as believing, confessing your sins, and denying your, your life in the waters of baptism and being raised up to walk a new life. That's it. God adds you to the church, as it says in Acts chapter 2, there in verse 47. You have an obligation then as a Christian to assemble with other Christians to participate in the work of the Lord and spread the gospel. Now, I have a friend who recently was converted to Catholicism. In order to become a Catholic, there's two ways. One, 
you're born into it, your parents have you sprinkled, which you will not find in the Bible. And then you'll grow up, and maybe around age 14, 15, or 16, somewhere around there, you'll have to go through several months of classes to confirm what your parents said you believed. Okay? And then at the end of that, if the priest finds you worthy to have passed your exams, then you're considered a full-blown Catholic. That's a 15-year process, if you're born into it. If you want to convert into it, that's at least a year process. And it's dependent upon what other men think. And again, I, I want to make this point clear. I'm not trying to intentionally just harp and harp on these other religious groups. But the most charitable thing we can say about them is they were founded by the wrong founder and they practice false doctrine. And to me, that's not very charitable to say, but that's the truth. When I read my New Testament, which is the same New Testament that you all have here this morning, I read about people who believed, were baptized, became Christians. No one could prevent that. No one could get in their way. And I read about people simply following after the Word of God, doing his practicing simple, pure New Testament Christianity. And what happened over the centuries is, as mankind made little changes to God's pattern, you ended up producing a group that looked nothing like the New Testament. It's like a little boy who had a, series, who had a set of 12 red blocks, and his friend had 12 green marbles. And each day he swapped one of his red blocks for a green marble, until finally all his blocks were marbles. That's what happened to pure, undefiled Christianity. Again, these changes, very few of them were malicious in, in intent. Some of them were very good-hearted, but mistaken. And so you change enough things little by little, you get something that looks nothing like what you have in your New Testament. But the thing is, God knew this was going to happen. In the New Testament, you'll read about a great apostasy or falling away that was going to happen. In Acts, the 20th chapter, Paul warns the Ephesian elders to keep watch over the flock because there will come a time when individuals from their own membership, their own congregations would rise up teaching perverse things and trying to lead away the people of God. You look here in Acts chapter 20, verses 29 and 30. It says, I know that after my departure, savage wolves will come in among you, not sparing the flock. And from among your own selves, men will arise speaking perverse things to draw away the disciples after them. He's warning the elders because they have a responsibility to make sure these false teachers are going to be rebuked and driven out so that the church may be left pure and undefiled. He also warns Timothy later in 1 Timothy chapter 4 towards the end of Paul's life that the apostasy was going to come. And that him as a preacher of the gospel ought to stand firm and rebuke those who were trying to defile, again, pure, undefiled Christianity. You look in 1, Corinthians, excuse me, 1 Timothy chapter 4, the first three verses. But the Spirit explicitly says that in later times some will fall away from the faith, paying attention to deceitful spirits and doctrines of demons, by means of the hypocrisy of liars seared in their own conscience as with a branding iron. Men who forbid marriage and advocate abstaining from foods, which God has created to be gratefully shared by those who believe and know the truth. Now, I'm not going to give you the answer, but I want you to think for a moment, based on what you know of religious teaching in the world, what groups advocate abstaining from marriage and the forbidding of certain foods. There's not just one, and there's, there's several. But it's interesting that Scripture foretold that those two things specifically were going to be a mark of the fact of the apostasy, of people falling away and going after those false teachings. And over time, it kept on evolving and evolving and evolving until you got this again, this group and several other groups that looked nothing like the New Testament. And the sad reality is, if you want to turn your Bibles to Matthew chapter 7, Christ on the Sermon on the Mount warned about this. Not specifically the great falling away, although I know he knew it and he forewarned his apostles about it. 
But you look here in, verse, in chapter 7, verses 21, and we'll read 22 as well. Warning about false prophets. He says, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father who is in heaven will enter. Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy your name, and in your name cast out many demons, and your name perform many miracles? And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. It's not on the screen, but 1 Samuel chapter 15 in verse 22. After Saul has disobeyed God and added to God's plan on how to deal with these, the wicked people that Saul was to destroy, he had added to it, he had saved some, he had captured the king alive. And the prophet comes to Saul and says, it is better to obey than sacrifice. God wants a contrite heart that follows after him with all their might and pure simplistic faith following the New Testament. He doesn't care if you've made pilgrimage on your knees on a cobblestone road or, or, or all these other things or all these works. That's not going to impress him. What impresses God is when people come to him with that broken, contrite heart seeking restoration and healing. Now, don't get me wrong. Christians have an obligation to be engaged in good works and to be lights in the world. We spent a whole class Wednesday night talking about that. But those things do not make us right with God and do not somehow cover us not following after his word. And so we have to concentrate on the word and his word alone. So going with that, we need to understand that this departure, no matter how good the intention may have been, and any departure, no matter how well the intentions may be, are not from God. Jehovah delights. There's three things that Jehovah really expects from his people and desires from his people, and that first and foremost is unity. Going back to that definition of denomination and to denominate something, it is to distinguish it in, by its very nature and character from something else. You look in John, the 17th chapter. This is when Christ is praying in the garden, and John records at length his prayer. Looking in verses 20 and 21, talking about the disciples' relationship in the world, he says, I do not ask on behalf of these alone, but those who believe in me through their word, that they may all be one, even as you, Father, and me, and I, and you, that they also may be in us, so that the world may believe that you sent me. Now, I want you to think to yourself and ask yourself, does the current religious world testify to the fact that God sent us? Does it show the unity that God would desire? Does it present a unified front that the world might believe in God and that Christ came by how his people act? I'm going to give you the answer. Just no. The fact that you have all these different groups and one teaches this thing and one teaches that thing and this group, this is okay, but it's not okay in that group and you have to wear this garb in that group but not that group and it goes on and on and on. And the thing is, going back to that quote from that Baptist manual, for the standard manual for Baptist churches, just about every denomination has another book in addition to the scriptures. In fact, uh, since Mark's here, I'm a Mark had told me one time that when he preached on this point, he used to carry around a big stack of denominational handbooks, and he would bring it out, but the sack got too heavy, and there's just too many of them to lug around to preach with. And that's the truth. The fact, what always amazes me, if you'll allow this digression, is when I read a headline of some denominational body taking a vote on what the Bible teaches. No. God's religion is not a democracy. It is a monarchy. And he is the king, and he sets the terms, and we, we as his citizens either fall in line or we don't. We don't get to choose and pick and choose and vote on doctrine. It is what it is. When I read something in the New Testament or the Bible at all, that gut checks me and I don't like it, the problem was not with Scripture. The problem was with me. It was the very fact that I live in this world means I am a fallen creature, I have sin, and that sin has distorted my vision. 
and the only way I can come back to a, some semblance of a right understanding of the word is coming to God for cleansing and following him at his word. But he, God delights and desires his people to be unified, and that doesn't happen by advocating division. Secondly, God wants us to have an absolute commitment to him because denominations by their very existence follow after men. You'll look here in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, excuse me, chapter 1, starting in verse 10. The Corinthian church dealt with this problem of religious division. And he says here, in, in, starting in verse 10 of 1 Corinthians 1, he says, Now I exhort you, brethren, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that, that you all agree, and there be no divisions among you, but that you be made complete in the same mind and in the same judgment. For I have been informed concerning you, my brethren, by Chloe's people, that there are quarrels among you. Now what I mean is this, that each one of you sa is saying, I am of Paul, and I am of Apollos, and I am of Cephas, and I am of Christ. Has Christ been divided? Paul was not crucified for you, was he? Or were you baptized in the name of Paul? These Corinthians brethren were falling after certain teachers, and the funny thing is that the names listed, Paul's an apostle, I believe Cephas here is, a, is the same Cephas, or Peter, the apostle. Apollos is a man mighty in the scriptures we read about in Acts who knew his Bible well. These individuals presented the unified front of Bible doctrine. They're not advocating for this division. It's men getting their own ideas and saying, well, I'm going to be a, be a Pauline Christian, or I'm going to be a Peter type of Christian. Again, going back to Acts 2, Acts 2. When they obeyed the gospel that, that day, they didn't become a type of Christian. They became Christians. But denominations, by their very founding, are following after men. Now, the ironic thing, I'm going to take the Lutheran Church, for example. Lutheran Church gets its name from Martin Luther, Luther, Lutheran. And they start, people who follow after that, start calling themselves Lutherans in Luther's own lifetime which he absolutely despised and hated. Uh, if you read anything about Martin Luther, he was a very cantankerous man, a very blunt man. A uh, little story to illustrate that point. Sometimes people would come to the house and his wife would answer, and this is why I'm here to see Martin Luther, and he would yell out from his study, Martin Luther is dead. Christ lives in me. That's the kind of man he was. Uh, but he said regarding the Lutheran name, he said, quote, I pray you leave my name alone and not call yourselves Lutherans, but Christians. Charles Spurgeon, a great Baptist preacher of the 1600s, who preached his, the tabernacle he preached in, 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 in London could fit thousands of people. He said, I pray the Baptist name may it perish. Let Christ's name be glorified. These are all individuals throughout history who Luther, especially, was trying to get back to what the Bible taught. Now, we could probably debate whether he was successful at that or not. But the attitude was, do not call yourselves after my name. Do not use man-made titles. Follow after Scripture alone and call yourselves after Christ. And thirdly, God only established one body of redeemed people that he is going to bring, uh, that God, Christ is going to bring hand over to God at the end of time. In Matthew chapter 16, in verse 18, after Peter, after Christ actually, after Christ had asked the disciples, who do the people say that I am? They said, well, some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah. And he turns the question again and says, okay, but who do you say that I am? And Peter said, you are the Christ, the Son of God. And Jesus said in verse 18, that it says, And I say unto you that thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church. Now that rock he's talking about is the confession that Jesus of Nazareth is the Christ, the chosen Messiah of God. And there's some cool wordplay that Jesus does in this text. In the Greek, Peter means a small stone that you can pick up. The rock that Jesus is talking about means bedrock. So in a sense... Jesus is saying to him, you are Peter, a man who can be picked up and swayed from to and fro. But upon my, I will build my church upon the immovable bedrock 
that steadfast confession that I am the Christ. That has foundations that you cannot remove. But the thing we want to notice, very simple question, answer to yourselves. How many churches did Jesus say he was going to build? Only one. One and only. That's it. But we need to think rightly about the church. We are not in a church right now. We are the church right now. We would be the same congregation, we would be the same body of the Lord's people, even this place were to burn down tomorrow. If it were to burn down tomorrow, we could assemble back here in the ashes and meet next week in 103 degree heat and have a very short abbreviated service. But we would still be the church. And that's because per Colossians chapter 1 and verse 18, he talks about how he gave head over all things to the body, which is his church. The church is the body of Christ. Several months ago, we did a lesson on the church of Christ, and we, that term, that sign out front, that's not a denominational title. We are not, quote, church of Christers. In fact, when I hear that, I, I cringe. We are Christians. And that name out front on our building is a biblical term we read about in scriptures, and it's a descriptive term. We are the body of believers, church, that belong to Jesus. That's all that matters. And that's all God wants from us. That's the only body he, and church he built, is that body of believers that belong to Jesus, who follow after him and what he has revealed in his New Testament. So if that's how we, that's how, how we got here, why there's so many denominations and why there's all this division, um, we need to understand the fact that the way to be the people of God that God desires is to return to pure Christianity of the New Testament. For if we do so, we'll be practicing the same faith of the apostles and the first Christians. But if you are not familiar with the New Testament or familiar with this point, you may be asking, well, can we even do that? If we are as far gone as you say we are, can we even get back to New Testament Christianity? And the answer is yes. Well, look at a couple of verses and the lesson will be yours. Looking at the principle of seed here, looking in Genesis chapter 1. Genesis chapter 1 and the verse is 12. We're going to look at a principle taught in creation and make the application to you and I. In the 12th verse of Genesis chapter 1, so we have the creation of the earth and all of its vegetation. It said, The earth brought forth vegetation, plants yielding seed after their kind, and trees bearing fruit with seed in them after their kind. And God saw that it was good. God created the world, physical and spiritual, that things reproduce after their own kind. If you plant an apple seed, you're not going to get an orange tree. And if you plant a fig tree, you're not going to get a tomato plant. Apple seeds produce apple trees. Tomato seeds produce tomato plants. So, how does this apply spiritually? Turn me to Luke chapter 8 and verse 11. Luke chapter 8 and the verses of 11, Christ speaking, uh, teaching on the parable of the sower, and he's given the explanation here in verse 11, or starting to give the explanation in verse 11. And verse 11 is what we want to focus in on. He says, now the parable is this, the seed is the Word of God. I must submit to you that the Word of God, when sown, unadulterated, unaccompanied by man-made doctrines and interpretations, but Scripture alone, true Scripture alone, will produce Christians. Not Baptists, not Methodists, just Christians. In fact, case in point, I've, I've, I've heard this story before. There was a group of uh, individual Christians who wanted to go preach the gospel to some remote, remote region. And they had airdropped in a crate of Bibles. And for some reason, their trip got delayed. And so it was several months later from their original arrival date that they got there. And when they got there, they found those people meeting on the first day of the week baptizing converts for remission of sins, pertaining to the Lord's Supper every first day of the week, singing with the heart only on the first day of the week. All they had done was follow what the New Testament said, and they were, they were very fortunate because 
they were in a region where all the man-made prejudices of denominationalism were not there. All they did was fo follow what was in the New Testament. Look in Acts chapter 8 real quick here. Acts the 8th chapter. We're going to read about an individual who went about sowing the seed of the kingdom of God. Looking here in verse 5. It said, Philip went down to the city of Samaria and began proclaiming Christ to them, at least preaching the gospel. You look down at verse 12. But when they believed Philip's preaching the good news about the kingdom of God and the name of Jesus Christ, they were being baptized, men and women alike. Even Simon himself believed, and after being baptized, he continued on with Philip as he observed the signs and great miracles taking place. He was constantly amazed. Now, Simon is interesting because he was a practitioner of witchcraft, of dark arts. And that in the ancient world meant all sorts of abominable things. But the gospel alone touched his heart, and he became a Christian. These individuals, when they heard the word in its purest form, became Christians and Christians only. And if, I leave, if you leave with nothing other than this, we need to understand that the Bible only makes Christians only. If you're here this morning and you want to be just a Christian, you're tired of all the religious division in the world and you just want to be a follower of Jesus, you can do that. You can do that right now. You can do it just as the first Christians did, as the Bible teaches. Jesus taught in Matthew, excuse me, in Mark 16 and verse 16, that he that believes and is baptized shall be saved, but he who does not believe shall be condemned. See, in baptism, as Peter says in 1 Peter chapter 3 and verse 21, you are calling upon the name of the Lord for a good conscience. It's not the removal of dirt. It's not the physical act. God is doing all the work in baptism. You are submitting to Christ, and you're becoming united with him in the likeness of his death, burial, and resurrection. If you, if you want new life this morning, you're tired of your sins and how pressing life can be. You're tired of denominationalism and religious division, and you just want to be a Christian. You can do so this morning. If you've done that in the past, you need to be restored to the faith. Please come forward. It's every stand to sing the song of invitation.